everyone, it's Father Hayes, and we are continuing our series of videos on the Mass, preparing to enter into a discussion on the Liturgy of the Eucharist. But we're still putting together this context, we're bringing together these different threads to form this deeper tapestry for us so that when we do go through the parts of the Mass for the Liturgy of the Eucharist, we have a deeper context to be operating in. So the last couple of videos, we've been exploring this theme, this thread of priesthood, which really points to and emerges from the one and only priesthood of Jesus Christ. One of the primary sources I've been using is this commentary on the Old Testament by uh, Dr. John Bergsma and Brad Pentry. So it's a good, good investment um, if you are able to uh, afford it. If not, they've got some other books that are just as informative. So, so moving forward, we said in the definition of the, that the Catechism gives us for the priesthood of Christ is he's not a priesthood of the tribe of Levi. He's not a member of the Levitical priesthood, which is the priesthood that basically assumed the focal uh, responsibilities of cultic worship following the event of the golden calf. Rather, he is a unique priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So the question is, who is Melchizedek and how does he relate to Jesus. So the first thing we can say is um, Melchizedek is rarely mentioned in the scriptures. In fact, there's only three main times that we hear about him. First in Genesis, and in Genesis, Abraham, after winning a battle, encounters um, Melchizedek, and Melchizedek offers bread and wine. He gives uh, Abraham his blessing, and Abraham gives him uh, a, a tribute of his war booty. So that's the first time we see him. Then we have a mention of Melchizedek in Psalm 110, which is a psalm that points to the Messiah as both priest and king. He's king and he's also a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And then finally, the letter to the Hebrews explores this person of Melchizedek and how he relates to Jesus and how he is prefigured in the Old Testament. So we only have in all the scripture three times where Melchizedek is mentioned. We also, the name might be a little familiar to you because he's mentioned in the prayers of the mass, particularly in the Roman canon. So in Eucharistic prayer one, we hear about the offering of Melchizedek. So who is Melchizedek? Well, Melchizedek, what we know of, uh, and this comes in largely from a description given in both Genesis and in the letter to the Hebrews, he is both a priest and a king, and he's king of Salem, which scholars will say is a early version of Jerusalem. So Melchizedek is a priest king of Jerusalem, and that's an important point to keep in mind. As I said, he offers a sacrifice of bread and wine. He gives Abraham his blessing and then receives tribute from Abraham. Now this is important because Abraham is the, the, the patriarch of all of the Jewish people. And a lesser figure receives blessing from a greater figure. And also a lesser figure will pay tribute to a greater figure. So what this is showing us in that relationship dynamic between Melchizedek and Abraham is that Melchizedek has a higher standing. So for Jesus to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek means that his priesthood is higher than that of the priesthood of the Levites, or even of the priesthood that flows from Abraham. So we can see Melchizedek specifically as a type of Christ. Remember we talked about in earlier videos this important notion of type, typology, where specific persons or things are in the Old Testament are pointing us forward to things that will be fulfilled in the New Testament, and that all the typology is focusing either on the person of Jesus, or the uh, person of Mary, in some cases, or the reality of the church is prefigured and seen in typology in the Old Testament. So uh, Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Interestingly enough, another type of Christ is King David. And what is interesting, too, is the, the parallels with David and Melchizedek. David is also from the tribe of Judah. He's not from the tribe of Levite. And David is also not the firstborn son in his family. 
Yet David acts in a priestly manner and is not punished by God. So how is that? Well, because David, as king, centralizes, he unites both the northern and the, the southern kingdoms by picking a neutral site for his, king, his capital of his kingdom, and that site is Jerusalem. So David is the king of Jerusalem. He also brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. So he is centering his authority around the city of Jerusalem and the worship around the Ark, which is the, the Ark of the Covenant, if you remember, was what contained the fragments of the stone tablets, the priestly staff of Aaron, and some of the manna from the desert. So we have this, this parallel that we're seeing with the person of David. And what Pintry and, um, and uh, uh, Bergs must say is, by centralizing the authority of the kingdom in Israel around the Ark of the Covenant in the city of Jerusalem, a case can be made that David is not arrogating to himself the rights of the Levitical priesthood. In other words, he's not improperly taking those rights to himself. Rather, he's attempting to restore the pre-Levitical Melchizedekian priesthood. Well, what came before the, the priesthood of the Levites was that natural priesthood that flowed from Adam through Noah, through Shem. Um, and is, he is, Melchizedek is centered in the city of Jerusalem. So David is acting as both a priest and king, and where he brings the ark in. Interesting enough, another thing that occurs in the second book of Samuel, in chapter 6, is that as David is bringing the ark into the city of Jerusalem, he is offering sacrifice, as we talked about, he's acting in a priestly manner. He's blessing the people, and through the interpretation, this is from the commentary of, of uh, Bergsman and Pitry, that he offers bread and wine. Now, if you look at the way it's presented in the scripture in that passage, it says that there's a portion, and it refers to a portion of meat, but they would say that there's, a, there's something that's lost in that translation. So some scholars are making the argument that there's also a reference to wine, and so that would be a parallel with Melchizedek. Again, this is where we kind of get into the scholarly debate back and forth about different things. Um, one of the other scholarly debates uh, is that, that some believe that Melchizedek is actually um, Shem, the son of Noah. Again, that's not something that um, we see mentioned in the scriptures itself. In fact, the description that the letter of the Hebrews gives us of Melchizedek is that Melchizedek is without father, mother, or ancestry, without beginning of days or end of life. Thus made to resemble the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. So the letter of the Hebrews is pointing to that that person of Melchizedek in a way that parallels the timelessness of the second person in the Trinity. Because, because he is God, he has no beginning and he has no end. So, um, one other little parallel between David and Melchizedek is David is the author of a majority of the Psalms. And we refer to Psalm 110, which is pointing to the Messiah as a Davidic king, so a king kind of in the, in the line and the model of David. Um, but he's described as both a king and a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So did David write that Psalm? Someone else write the Psalm about both David and prefiguring Jesus? That would be something that the scholars could kind of go back and forth in that minutia. But the point for our discussion is that what we're seeing is with the person of Melchizedek, and then to a lesser degree, but, but an equal degree, um, the person of David, that we're seeing more of these threads starting to weave together, pointing us ultimately to the person of Jesus Christ, who is not simply another priest among many, but the only priest who offers the only sacrifice, the only perfect sacrifice. And the letter of the Hebrews kind of expands on that a bit in the description of that sacrifice, which we will talk about a little bit more in a future video. You got to be with you.